officers wanted to get this man behind bars. They say catching him was their top priority because they were worried that he might attack again. Do you have what it takes? Dozens of beauties showed up at Colony Center today to see if they do. You don't want to deal with that on top of these cold temperatures, right, Christine? No, you don't, Christina. You know that feeling you get when you're just not sure if your car is going to start in the morning because it's just so cold outside? Well, we're inside one of the News 10 vehicles right now. This is one of the newer ones, so hopefully it starts. It hasn't been started yet this morning, so we'll look for that sound. Uh-oh, that's not a good sound. Flash flooding that's gone on here. As you see, the parking lot is flooded and the rain is still coming down. All the doors around the school are currently locked except for the main entrance here. But as you see, they already have one camera monitoring this room with this new security system. They'll have several more. Yeah, it's been a very um, interesting night here. A lot of really positive energy. Many rooting, of course, for Governor Romney to win as this race has been very close throughout the night. Right now, they actually have a building on North Main Street surrounded because they believe the suspect is inside. Now, if we look over my shoulder here, you may be able to see there is a part of the SWAT team, a member of the SWAT team up on the building right there. The investigator tells me that the driver of this silver Toyota was traveling northbound along Route 22, while the driver of the white Impala was traveling southbound. Well, this really is an unprecedented day for the Boston community. Now, we're set up right now across the street from the police staging area. There are thousands of law enforcement officials locally from the state and federally that have come here to search for this suspect and to keep the community here safe. The streets of Watertown transformed into what looks like a war zone. <laughs> Tanks, Black Hawk helicopters, and heavily armed officers on almost every street. Businesses on lockdown, schools closed, and almost one million Bostonians asked to stay inside as authorities search for Zokar Zarnaev, the second suspect in the marathon bombings. Michael Demergen and his 17-year-old daughter, Courtney, were on their way home from Logan Airport after picking up their new dog, Hunter, when they were told they couldn't go home. It's been pretty chaotic, you know, the whole thing, you know, in a hole, and uh, we wanted to get him home, and we weren't allowed in the house. It's unreal. It's like something that wouldn't happen in a quiet, boring town like this one, and it's just like something from a movie. The Demergents say they live on Spruce Street, right in the middle of where police were conducting the manhunt, going door to door to search for Zarnaev. I'm hoping that everything becomes under control soon. I don't know when. I don't even know what the situation if they got them yet. Well, just another example for you here. The target behind me is on lockdown. There are uh, employees that are inside there right now that uh, cannot come out because they were told by authorities that they cannot leave today. As you see, there's still a very big presence here. All in all, a very scary day for locals. Uh, the governor, the mayor, and authorities say they know that it's been an inconvenience for some people here in the Boston community to stay inside all day, but they do want to say thank you that it's been a very big help to them. For now, I'm reporting from Watertown, Christine O'Donnell for the News Center. These tree limbs are huge, and I was just speaking with some neighbors, and they say that these were literally flying by their windows earlier today, and it was one of the scariest things they say they've ever seen. Now, not too long ago, we were actually uh, driving through one of the hardest-hit areas of the storm. My photographer, uh, Bill Webster, and I, and here's a little bit of a clip of what we experienced. We were driving along Route 7 in North Troy when the winds on the roads got so intense we had to pull over. Every car pulled over and put their hazards on. It's uh, definitely in no condition to be driving out at this point. As the rain pounded down, the winds started to shake the car. It got pretty scary for us for a few minutes there. We had to hold our breath as we waited to see what the storm would bring. 
Obviously, a lot of wind was blowing and branches were falling from all different directions. Later, we arrived on Oakwood Avenue in Troy, where people asked us if there was a tornado. I was scared for my neighbors because they, they have a lot of kids. The street a mess with down trees and power lines. Rich Green tells us his girlfriend was rescued from this car after a tree fell on top of it. While she was in the car, the storm hit. She had to get rescued out of a, uh, some nice gentleman helped her out of the car. Going through or what? Oh, she, oh she's fine. She's fine. <laughs> With her family by her side, Bettina Blaney looks at the memorial set up right near where her nine-year-old son, Jonathan, was killed. Filled with emotion, she admired the stuffed animals people left to remember her son. Still, she says it doesn't make the grieving process any easier. He, he was such a good, healthy boy. I couldn't ask for nothing more. Nothing besides my baby back. That's all I want. But I know I can't. But Johnny, rest in peace, please. Police say 49-year-old Brian Wilson had just turned on to Bloomingdale in his pickup truck when he struck the boy, who witnesses say was riding his bike. Captain John Sierra says he believes the hit was an accident and says he does not plan on charging Wilson. Jonathan's 12-year-old brother, Zach Etherton, lights a candle to remember. I miss him playing football, me and playing baseball, and I was being mean to him, but now I miss him. He's my brother forever. Well, I'll be strong for you as much as we can. We'll get through this in so with you. So please, watch over us. Just a heartbreaking story. Now, coming up on News 10 at 6 o'clock, we'll have more from the family, including a special message from Jonathan's grandfather. Nothing's bulletproof. Radio check, test one. In the parking lot of Stewart's in the town of Berlin, Sergeant Shane Holcomb prepares his team to bust a home for child pornography. Loud and clear. Over the past two months, the team, with help from the FBI, has been tracking illegal downloads onto someone's computer. Uh, we anticipate that there could be anywhere between one and three people in the residence. We'll get them secure first, and then we'll... You never know who's on the other side of the door, so you don't necessarily know what you're going to encounter. We have to be prepared for a worst-case scenario. The short drive brings us to a Plank Road residence. Officers surround the property. They secure the home, finding eight people inside. They were all asleep, actually, at uh, you know 11:45 in the morning. Keep calm. I don't know what the hell is going on. And we are gathering some information on a potential suspect of who may be uh, the perpetrator. You get woken up by police with guns telling you they're executing a search warrant. Several laptops and disks are confiscated. Then an arrest is made. You just don't say anything, okay? Mm -hmm. Holcomb tells us Michelle Seiler admitted the laptops were hers. I mean, it was a friend of mine. Right. I've known her for 12 years, and you really don't know somebody like you think you do until evidently okay. it's too late. Do you have any sort of comment, I mean, about what's happening? Scary. 